Cues. Why would you ever use a cue? Well, this is a cue. A cue holds a bunch of messages. So what really is a cue? A cue is a log, a set of messages that sit in the log, that has some notion of order, right? So there's a messages show up here, and they're being enqueued into that queue, and uh, they're being dequeued from that queue, typically, typically in that order. Not necessarily always in that order. We can get to places where um, that's not true, where you are probably reading a message with a certain number. Why would you do that? We can go and find that out also. So that's the basic shape of a queue. That's obvious. It also has nothing to do with disk or with Amazon Q or with, with whoever other queuing system you have right now um, or what you want to use. Um, it has nothing to do with that yet. So that's the basic shape of Q. Stuff in, stuff out. Why would you use such a thing in a distributed system? Fairly simple. Let's go and take a look at um, what happens if you have a web server and the web server does a lot of work. You have a web server. The web server now has um, some back-end stuff that it needs to go and do. So there's some middle tier, and you have a lot of these web servers. You get a lot of traffic. If you get a lot of traffic into your web servers, and you are doing this in this push request response, uh, response, uh, request response path, and way. You are taking all the pressure with all the connections that comes in here for writes and reads and you're putting all that pressure straight up on your middle tier. That may be okay for some things. That is not necessarily okay once we have things like money in play where you're submitting an order and now you're making a promise and you go to the user and say I promise you, I have your credit card, it will charge it exactly once, and it will deliver the goods to you. Once you make promises like this, you can't have a system that's kind of overstressed up here, right? Um, however big the pressure is, if you say, customer, I promise to you that I will do that, then you have to do that. So that means that the backend system that's actually executing these orders needs to be able to work in a reliable fashion and you, as much as you can't work under stress in a reliable fashion, the system can't work under stress in a reliable fashion. So how do we get that piece, uh, how do we get peace into the system? Well, a queue is a good way to do that. You have some pressure that builds up from here and so you're dealing with all these requests and you're dealing with an influx of of orders, of jobs really, that go into your system. What you do is you throw them into a queue. Now if this load here is very spiky, all right, so this is time, these are the number of requests. If that load is very spiky, this spikiness would usually go straight through the system. So the system will be under, complete, under spiky stress. Right? You, have a lot, you need to have a lot of capacity throughout the entire system to deal with the spikes throughout the system. If you have a queue in the middle, you can turn the spikiness by, by ways of the queue into this. And the reason why you can do that is because on the queue here, let me go and switch the color, after the queue, you have a number of workers and you can tune the number of workers to your demands and there's a wonderful way to do that. You can tune the workers and those workers basically just go and pull on that queue. So, in fact, the direction is here. And they do work, so they take a job. Right? This is, they're competing readers. So this one takes the job, now the job one is, sits in here, and it does that job. And only when it's done with that job, it returns and gets a new job. So there's a lot of jobs flowing in, 
And what you want to do is you want to get the spikiness out of the system and you want to go and, and take the peak demand and have, have the peak demand queue up in that queue. And then as you go to lower demand, you want to have enough capacity to actually go and, and clean the backlog. But during the spiky times, you want, to, you want the, the queue to grow. And during the low times, you want to have enough, enough here to have those workers. So the workers work at a pretty steady pet, a pace and they're just work, work, they just work and, and work on the backlog. The wonderful thing is, so we have those messages that are being consumed. Now the wonderful th thing is that you can typically count the number of messages, five in this case, um, that are in the queue, which means you can now look ahead and you can see how much work do you have and how much work do you, do you have by average. So you can go and observe the queue, so you have this worker cord, with this worker process that sits up here, right? or multiple worker processes, and you can have a, you can have a load manager. Um, the load manager kind of sits up here, and the load manager now can go and look at, observe the queue, and basically do readings on what the queue length is over time, and then it can run statistics and say, if over a sustained period of, let's say, five minutes, my queue length is, t is growing in tendency, then you know that you have a spike and you probably don't have enough workers, you can go and provision another worker, however you do this in your system, all right? And add a worker so that now um, you can deal with the capacity. Think of the same, this is the same thing happens in the supermarket, right? There's a supervisor who's watching over all the, the, the cash registers. And if the queues get too long behind all the cash registers, what they do is yeah, they, add, they open another cash register and then you see that the customers are actually flowing to that new ca cash register and the queues get, get shorter. Here we have a single work queue, right? Um, and that's exactly what's happening. You have a single queue of people filing in, right? If you go to places like Costco where it's really busy, we have a Costco right, right around here, uh, for instance. And yeah, people will go and line up into the big aisle so they're long before they can go and distribute up here. There's a single, there's a single line, so that kind of holds true here. Um, so the queue is a wonderful way to go and make the spiky stuff flat, and it's a wonderful way to manage load and to actually add enough capacity. Now, of course, this load manager thing can also observe that over a certain period of time, the queue is empty or the tendency goes down, right? And if the tendency, the, the queue length goes down, then it can start thinking about whether it wants to take a worker away. So it overall, having a queue in the middle adds a lot of uh, predictability into your system. Another thing um, that you can do with a queue is um, modeling request, request response on it. Because a lot of people just think, hey, um, this is only good for you know, sending orders down into a uh, into a, a backend system, but really, I have a request response system. I do HTTP at the front end. I need to do lookups, so they need to be synchronous. And the answer is actually, you can insulate your system from a lot of that load um, very nicely um, if you go and uh, and model request response on on here as well, where you effectively where you're effectively sending people into a wait loop if you if you get under stress, and a queue is actually quite uh, is actually a nice way to do this. So um, in this in this world, you still still have the same model, right? You have these workers, and the workers are backing you up. So now you have expensive work, but you need to give feedback to the user if that work completes, and if that work doesn't complete, then at least tell them, hey, look, um, I can't get that work done right now, but it's being taken care of. So that they come back, come back later. So one way to do this, I'm going to make a little bit of room here, um, is have the same model. So we have this request thing, the requester. Let's say that's a web page, and that web web page takes requests and throws them into the queue. What the web page, or let's be precise, that web server also has. So we're talking distributed system here, right? So this could be. Windows Azure queue, it could be a message buffer that we, we have in the system in Windows Azure App Fabric, it could be an Amazon queue queue, I mean, it all depends what, what messaging technology you need and you use. Um, you go and have for this box that hosts this web, web page, 
you have a local reply queue. So there's another queue in play here that is the reply queue or response queue as it's being, as, as it's being called that sits up here. And what you do as you passing all these messages up here from this machine into this shared queue, which is also used by a number of different web servers, right? So N front end machines can go and, and submit work into this shared queue, into the work queue so that the backend workers can get it, is every single one of those machines has their own private kind of reply queue that messages can go back into. Now, if you have a sophisticated, a fairly sophisticated queuing system, it will have a notion of a cor of correlation. Amazon Q, for instance, has it has that notion of cor correlation, and m very many uh, queue systems have that notion cor uh, of correlation as well. So, what you do is you send a message in here, and now you send a reference to that queue in the message. And the way you do that typically is you have a you have a um, a property in that queue message that is called reply to or response queue or respond to or something like that. Um, it's the response queue in, uh, in Amazon queue, for instance, that points to that. Now, now the work flows to an arbitrary worker, which may be on, on one box or it may be on ma very many boxes. By competing on this queue, right, all the workers compete for work on that queue Whoever is available for that work is going to pick up the is going to pick up that job. Is going to process it on its own time, and now it has an it has an indication where to go to. It has a reply to address, so it has done its job, the worker, and now throws the reply message into the queue. The process that has sent this queue. So now we should have a notion of what that process is, right? So there's a thread, or some process, some a logical thread at least that's that's been servicing a certain certain request that has sent the message. What that now does is, as soon as it sends the message, it hangs on um, the reply to the reply queue, and now says something. It says, "Receive by correlation ID." And that's the ID of the original message that get, went in here. So there's a message ID that's being associated with this message as it, as it is sent. You remember, you remember this? And as the message goes around, what this thing here does is it takes the incoming message ID and put, stamps that onto the correlation ID property that goes up here. So you can go and receive by that correlation ID. And that's something that you need to have a sophisticated queuing system for um, that actually has that notion, Emerson Q, um, actually has that notion, so you can use it for that purpose. Where you have received by correlation ID, you pull that message out, and now the right thread is actually getting the right message, and you will include in here a timeout. And that timeout really depends on how patient or impatient your system is. Um, if you use um, a contemporary queuing system uh, here, you can pump hundreds of thousands of messages through this pipe every second. So it's not really a speed question, um, and they don't necessarily. It all depends on your on your requirements. Whether you want to get them to disk, and we're going to have transactional, or whether, whether you want to have any so-called express queues, which uh, um, uh, work in memory but don't give you all the guarantees. So it all depends on that. But you want to have a timeout that sits in here, and the timeout can be fairly short. You can say, "Well, I need to have a message. I need to have an answer on this for after two seconds, three seconds, ten seconds, twenty seconds, depending on what that job is." And while you're waiting for that answer, it's certainly up to you to go and keep and start responding. You know, give a hundred continue. You know, just give give data. Um, have the people go and uh, entertain themselves with with uh, some animations. Um, all depending on what that job is, you can be ultra um, nervous, short time spends, or you can be very patient, longer time spends. We can't really exceed some basic thresholds in the HTTP infrastructure if this is HTTP. So longer than a minute is very is uh, typically not possible because of um, the intermediaries, the proxies will basically just go and, and cut you off. So um, so if that happens, you have this, this timeout, the timeout times out, what are you going to go and say, hey, we submitted that job, 
because now you can rely on some characteristics of the queue because the queue is not going to lose the message typically. So you know it's going to, it's going to get here. And, if, and you, will, you know that you will get a reply. Right? That's something, some basics that you uh, can, should rely on for the 80% case. I mean, there are trade-offs. Um, yes, sometimes it will fail, but typically it's going to work. Um, and typically in a, in a very, very, very high, so I would say the 80% case, but really it's 99 point whatever percent. Um, this will all operate correctly if your system is right. And uh, so you will get, eventually get a response for this. At least you can go and mine the logs for where that went, because there is, if you can't deliver a message, if you lose this, or if the system fumbles it, there is some places where that goes to in sophisticated queuing systems. There's, for instance, a dead letter queue, right? Uh, the message has a time to live, the, the queue got too long, and now the message gets evicted from the queue because it's expired. Well, there's still a dead letter queue where that shows up. So there's always, as soon as you have it in the queuing system, that request is something that you can trace and that you can find in the system. You just have to have enough tooling around it. So back to the, ti back to the, back to the timestamp. So let's say this is three seconds and you don't get the response inside of three seconds. What do you do? You return to the user and say, we're working on this. Um, please go to the following URI, uh, URI to check the status. And that's where you go and ultimately do a lookup in a database or whatever, whatever the result of this work is so that people can go and take a look at that. And then you can do the work. And instead of giving the all clear to the user right here, you're basically delaying giving the all clear. But at least you have a path to give the user an immediate answer um, if uh, you are actually quick enough to get that work done. So that's a general overview over um, what you could use queues for. We can go into much more detail um, on queues certainly and on queue patterns, uh, but I hope that was useful for you. Um,